Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Grain Rounds today and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Adrian Lati, who is joining us from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, this invitation was extended a while ago when we actually had hoped to see her here earlier and we had to postpone it. So I'm particularly pleased that she was able to come uh, even after a second try. Uh, let me briefly tell you where she's from and give you a sense of her contribution to psychiatry research, which is going to be uh, clear after the hour. Um, Dr. Lati is originally from Belgium, from the eastern part of Belgium. She went to medical school in Liège, uh, and after finishing medical school, also completed a residency and also started uh, as a faculty member in Belgium before she was tempted to leave and go to the United States, where she started first at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And then, get this, after having trained and being a faculty member, went back to do a residency in psychiatry and completed that in Michigan, returned to the MPRC, where she did seminal neuroimaging research, and some of that will be clear based on her presentation, and then was lured to go to Birmingham in 2006 and has been there and built a very impressive group focused primarily on using spectroscopy um, and other functional and structural imaging methods to understand mechanisms of psychosis. She has an interest in the hippocampus, um, but she's also interested in many other things and has pioneered also the effects of antipsychotic drugs in patients with schizophrenia and how neuroimaging can be used to understand the mechanisms of both the therapeutic as well as the adverse effects. Uh, she was uh, so successful that she was asked to become the interim chair. And then literally the months the pandemic hit, uh, became the chair of the department and has served in that role now for three years. Um, despite these significant administrative responsibilities, continues to run a very active research program. All right, so you will hear a little bit more about how we can use neuroimaging to gain insight into the pathology of early psychosis using brain imaging. Like that? Can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so, well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. And um, thank you for uh, Dr. Heckers for inviting me. Uh, so you can tell like Dr. Heckers, I don't have a prototypical Southern accent. <laughs> so you have to uh, deal with this. Um, so, I have no financial disc disclosure to report. So the outline, um, I'm going to be speaking about if we can use functional imaging, functional connectivity to predict treatment response to antipsychotic medication. I will speak also about the relationship between the duration of untreated psychosis, or the GOP, and functional connectivity, and also treatment response, I will be speaking about the excitatory inhibition imbalance hypothesis of schizophrenia. And I will end by speaking about a, a new development in my research is my interest in bioenergetic bio dysfunction in patients with schizophrenia. So I will uh, really focus on two brain regions. One is the hippocampus and the other one is the anterior cingulate. And this is because early, when I was at Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, I did a PET uh, studies with O15 and realized that there was those regions were involved with positive symptoms, but not only that, they were involved with response to antipsychotic medication. So I have decided then to pursue those regions further. So, 
schizophrenia is a heterogeneous disorder, likely involving multiple underlying uh, pathological mechanisms. However, all patients are treated with the same thing. We all treat patients with antipsychotic medication. So we know that you know the treatment response is really divided in three. So a third of the patients have good response to medication, and the other two thirds has either suboptimal or have a poor response to antipsychotic anti medication. So one can argue that those who have a good response to antipsychotic medication, maybe those who have an increased release of dopamine in um, the stratum as seen by um, the group of uh, Anissa Abidagam. So what you're saying here is the, re the, the, the release of dopamine in, in control and in patient with schizophrenia. Each dot represents person. And, but as you can see, there's only a limited number of patients who have really increased, will increase the dopamine. So even with the good responder, some patients have an early response, you know, within a few weeks, just maybe one or two weeks, and those have more delayed response to medication, uh, up to 16 weeks of treatment. So what is the underlying pathology in those, in those who have a sub, suboptimal power response or delay response? Can we figure out that one? So that's why I thought that to deconstruct treatment response heterogeneity will help to identify identity target for new medication. Does that make sense? So to do that, I use several imaging techniques. I use MR cotton, MR spectroscopy. So it's a single voxel spectroscopy where we put a voxel in the region where we want to obtain measurement of neural metabolite. And for, for each of the person, you, you obtain this spectrum and you can quantify a number of neural metabolite. And in, in my case, we can measure the combined glutamate and glutamine peak. That's what, what we call the GLX. The other method that I use is the functional connectivity. So I'm sure some, some of you know, but the bold signal presents slow fluctuation in the brain. And the, fun the functional connectivity is the synchronization of, of those slow fluctuation in the brain between distant brain regions. So look at these two regions here and here, and you can see that the fluctuation are really in sync. So those will, have, will be highly functionally connected. On the other hand, this region is basically anti-correlated with uh, the other two regions. And also, we also use um, white matter to look at, um, to understand heterogeneity of treatment response, but I will not speak about that today. Um, so we know that a certain number of factors are associated with treatment response. You, you heard about that when you were uh, in med school or during residency, gender, age of illness at onset, severity of psychotic symptom at, at baseline before try, you know, treating family history of psychosis, neurological sub-sign, genetic markers, premorbid function, and cognitive function. So we, we know those, but it's difficult to make a prediction at the individual level using those factors. So we really need to, to have something else that is more reliable and is specific to a person. So uh, this is why I'm going to make Dr. Hackers happy because I'm going to be speaking. <laughs> I know what I was doing when I came here. Right? Um, I'm going to speak about uh, the hippocampus and there's a ton of evidence that the hippocampus are abnormal in, in patients. You know, first there's memory impairment, imaging studies, not only structural uh, coming from here, functional, coming from here, and also MR spectroscopy, 
and that's a lot coming from my lab. Postmortem studies also. Also, this is uh, Max Wawoski did this postmortem um, meta-analysis. Very interesting. Um, and we also know that hippocampal abnormality are also seen in the high-risk population. So this is for the background of why we should be looking at the hippocampus, right? Um, so why did I pick the hippocampus to think about treatment response? And that's linked to my previous work when I was in Maryland and, uh, and spilling in, uh, at UAB, is that I've, I've seen the hippocampus is part of a network of antipsychotic action. And this is the network we have, of course, the substantia nangua uh, VTA, uh, projecting to the ventral stratum, ventral pallidum, thalamus, and the my two favorite region, the hippocampus, and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And the different arrow, uh, you know, show the, the type of projection. So the, the green projection at the glutamatergic projection, the red at the GABA allergic project projection, and the blue at, at the dopaminergic connection. So what I did then was to look at the functional connectivity of the hippocampus. So I, we, we did what we call put a voxel from a region we want to see which, uh, which other region of the brain are in sync with that region. And this was in the context of looking at two cohorts of patients to see whether this functional connectivity can predict treatment response. So this is two cohorts of patients. One cohort is a cohort of patients with schizophrenia who are unmedicated, but they are chronic. So they are not what we call medication naive. Right? And for those, they were when they were in raw, they were off drug for at least two weeks. They were scanned before treatment, and then they were scanned after treatment. And then the other cohort is a, a cohort of medication naive first episode psychosis uh, that were recruited from usually the emerg emergency room, so they they were off medi not without medication, and then we treated them. And then uh, and scan them again after six weeks. So the idea was really, you know, can we is the, if, if the scan the functional connectivity at baseline can predict how they're going to be doing on medication at, at week six, and having two cohort scan on two different scanners. So this was scan on a prisma on a Allegra scanner and on a um, Prisma scanner. If we have concordant results, then it's really important because this is something that can be reproduced in different cohorts of patients on different scanners. So now let's think a little bit about predicting treatment response. What, that, what is really more important is really to identify those who, have, who are going to have a poor response, right? So the idea then is that you can, we would be able to identify those who have a poor response and try to be more aggressive at the start of the treatment, probably going to close the pain faster than we would with, for those who, you know, appear to uh, have a good response to medication. Right? So this is the result. So what you're going to see are the region here in the occipital cortex. This is the first cohort, and the second cohort is the occipital cortex. So for those two cohorts, the same pattern, the greater the functional connectivity between the hippocampus and the occipital cortex was associated with better treatment response. So now you can ask me, you know, the occipital cortex, you know, out of the blue, what, 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 what is it coming here? Huh? Coming the, from the left field, something like that. But there's different way, way to think about it. Um, one is there's a lot of projection from the visual cortex to the hippocampus. You know, so there may be some, some reason why this 
connectivity pattern is being seen with the with this region. So then, so this is for me, it's really indicate that functional connectivity might be a great tool to uh, to try to predict treatment response. I have used other region of the of the network to look whether we had the same result. result. And myself and others have a look at the functional connectivity of the stratum, makes sense too, and it's the same result. It can, it really can predict also functional connectivity, but I think it has to be regions that are involved in this network. So, again, speaking about treatment response, are they modified risk factor? And the answer, unfortunately, or fortunately, is yes. The, the duration of untreated psychosis. So, what, so this is the time between the onset of positive symptoms and the time that patient finally receives treatment. In the, in, the, in the United States, the median uh, DUP is 74 weeks. So during that time, they have positive symptoms and they are not treated. And meta-analysis meta -analysis over meta-analysis show that the longer the duration of untreated psychosis, the worse the outcome. So that would be, you know, an easy factor to change. We try to identify, yeah, I know, <laughs> easily said, right? But but I think that's why we have first episode psychosis clinic, so that you know we can at least. And for that myself, the most important thing was to speak with the resident about this, because sometimes the resident, especially if they look like they, you know, they're in college, they look normal, they are really reluctant to try uh, to start treatment. So, so then I was really um, interested to know, you know, what's the mechanism of the relationship between DUP and poor treatment response, right? So I did a functional connectivity analysis, and for, for this analysis, I used what we call the, the three major functional network. So the, this, the default mode network, salience network, and central executive network. So those are regions that are all within a network. They are all in sync with each other. Um, so I'm going to show you with the result, and they are very clear. In each uh, network, we saw that there was a negative correlation between um, the DUP and the functional connectivity in the network. So the longer the DUP, the, the smaller the reduced functional connectivity. And you see that the same pattern in the salience network and in the central executive network. So then we, um, those people uh, were treated. So we, we knew the DUP, because we interviewed the patient, the family, when they started the study, and then we uh, treated them for uh, 16 weeks and then evaluated treatment response. And what we found with that limited data, this was not a meta-analysis, we found that, in fact, there was a relationship between longer DUP and worse treatment response. And we've we also identified that this relationship between the DUP and treatment response is mediated through the functional connectivity of the default mode network. So what happened is really whatever the mechanism is uh, that explain how the DUP impact treatment response is, at, is in part responsible, you know, the outcome of this functional connectivity. So now I'm going to switch gear a little bit and speak about the excitatory inhibitory imbalance hypothesis. So this is um, the, basic, the basic processing unit of the cortex. This is the GABAergic interneuron, 
in the glutamatergic pyramidal, the excitatory pyramidal, glutamatergic pyramidal neuron. So the several hypotheses have been put for about how this imbalance could be explained. One of those, and I say one of those because there are several, is that those the NMDA receptor on those GABAergic interneurons are abnormal. So the inhibitory tone, you know, remember GABA is the inhibitory tone of GABA on the glutamatergic pyramidal neuron is reduced and there's a more glutamate being released, right? And we know that glutamate in high level can be neurotoxic such as in doing a, a seizure. So one of the hypotheses is that, you know, that we have is that this imbalance could really explain why we have abnormal functional connectivity and a poor treatment response. So what I wanted to do also was to test the idea this hypothesis that glutamate was excitotoxic and test that in the hippocampus. And where the hippocampus, as I mentioned before, you know, studies after studies have shown that there's a reduced size of the hippocampus, uh, including in first episode patient. Um, so I wanted to combine, you know, a, a study looking at the, the size of the hippocampus and with measurement of glutamate in the hippocampus. Um, so this is uh, the hippocampus, of course. In a previous studies, in a chronic patient who were medicated, we had shown that there was an increase, glut increased glutamate level in this voxel in uh, the hippocampus, and that was correlated with uh, a decreased size in the in the hippocampus. So more glutamate, less volume. So that was consistent with this, you know, um, excitatory, uh, excitatotoxic hypothesis. But we wanted to, to use a, 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 um, a cohort of medication naive, because you you never know what antipsychotic medication are going to be doing, even if they've been, uh, you know, off for two weeks. So we, um, this is a longitudinal study. Uh, we involve, again, again, medication naive, and then we scan patients uh, at six weeks and 16 weeks, and they were treated at, during that time with risperidone. And then we obtain a measurement of uh, glutamate in the hippocampus. We, we use a, a left voxel hippocampus. Um, so this is, again, the result, this is glutamate. This is healthy control. This is first episode patient. And you can see that there were no significant differences um, in a glutamate level uh, between uh, the group. And there were no effect of treatment. And this is the different uh, level in patient uh, over the three time period. So obviously, glutamate in this population is not increased. This is different than what, what we have shown. And, the, and this is a pretty large cohort of patients. So then we did a measurement of volume of the whole hippocampus, but also of the subfield. And what we saw was um, this is healthy control. This is patient with schizophrenia. And at baseline, there was already a difference between patient and healthy control. OK, that has been shown before. But then what is interesting is that look at what happened to the patient. Now, uh, there's a significant difference in volume between week 6 and week 16. It means that the in front of us, the volume you know, the, the size of the hippocampus are decreasing. So it's likely there's something going on. There's a toxic mechanism going on there. 
And remember, this is young people, and they are losing, you know, possibly cognitive function because of this, right? And then when we look at the, the subfield, we saw the same pattern. You see the uh, one region, this is the CH3, um, this is also the pre -subiculum. But you, you can see that, you know, for each subfield, the same scenario, you know, it goes further between week six and 16. The other thing that we saw is that there were progression. So it started with, you know, a, a difference between healthy control and patient in uh, the CA1 and the pre -subiculum. Then week six, it was CA1 pre plus the undented gyrus. And then week 16, it was the same three region plus an additional one. one. So the, the, there was a spread of the, of the effect. So then, you know, the question, can we put glutamate and the, the decrease in size together? And we didn't see anything. So the, the glutamate level in patient did not correlate with at baseline with the size, the volume of the of the sub the or the whole hippocampus, and they were not predictive of later change in volume. So I want to caution you because you know this would this data you know appear to you know not be in, in, explaining an excitatory an excitatoxic effect of glutamine. But this is an MRS study. You know, so this is where we measure everything glutamate, not only glutamate, the synapse, the neuron. So you know, there's really limitation to do that. Um, so the, my, my most important question is really, if it's not that, what is, right? And I think that's where we still have to um, really ask some some question, how are we going to try to answer uh, that question and really try to make it that the patient that don't have a, a decreased size, hippocampal size in front of us, right? But the, some of the other factors that could affect the hippocampal volume, be, of course, the antipsychotic drugs, right? That would not be at baseline, but for this further decrease. And that's very difficult to, to tear apart because unless we do a placebo control study, it's going to be difficult. And when I look at the literature looking at the effect of antipsychotic medication on hippocampal volume, it's all over the place. Uh, it's, in, it's normalized, worsened, so there's really no cons consistent data. But other factor could be, it could be to related to uh, increased hippocampal activity. There may be GABAergic mechanism involved in this um, decrease size. The duration of untreated psychosis, I will show you a slide about that. And then the hippoca incomplete hippocampal inversion as uh, reported by your group, illness duration, treatment response, polygenic risk factor, and brain derived neurotrophic factor. So the, there's really a lot of things that uh, could you know, explain this. And, and we have to figure out how we're going to get to the answer. And this is the effect of the duration of untreated psychosis on the volume. Uh, this is um, the whole hippocampus, and this is the, the longer the duration of uh, the, the untreated psychosis, uh, the smaller uh, the volume. And that was true also for the, the different subfield. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and the, the, the anterior cingulate cortex is a little bit like the hippocampus. They're really converging evidence of abnormality in that region. There's known cognitive deficit. There's a, a lot of imaging studies, structural, functional, MRS, and also a lot of postmortem studies indicating abnormality. And the data I'm going to show you is from this region of the dorsal anterior cingulate. This is a whole cingulate, but it has to be divided in, in sub-regions. So, so this is um, 
um, a more cognitive type of region. So what I wanted to uh, obtain was again in sync with this inhibitory excitatory hypothesis of schizophrenia, I wanted to obtain both measurement of glutamate and GABA. So same design is the same patient. We have used different um, uh, imaging technique. Um, and this is a voxel. And to do that, we had to, do, to use two uh, imaging techniques to first measure glutamate, and then with another technique called megapress to, use, to measure GABA. Um, so I'm going to see, show you the result here. This is the glutamate measurement in the anterior cingulate cortex. And what you see, this is a patient, this is the healthy control, no significant difference. And then when we, there were an effect of um, time, and this was due to this significant difference between, on, in glutamate level, between in the in the first episode patient between week six and week sixteen, and we saw there was the week sixteen were lower than the week six. So this is really interesting because at least two imaging studies, which were done at seventy in medicated first episode patient, reported a decrease in glutamate measurement in the ACC. So. If we had, if I would have scanned here, I would have had probably a different um, scenario than when we scanned the patient here. So I think understanding the longitudinal effect uh, is really important. So this is really the exciting thing for me, is, is, is GABA. So I mentioned we measure GABA in the SCC, and here, finally, we, we found a significant difference with patients having lower uh, GABA measurement in, in the anterior cingulate. And then this is healthy control. This is a patient as a function of time. You can see that the, the GABA level remained lower. Uh, so, you know, we, we now have, we're going to have to figure out you know, what's the implication of those lower um, GABA level that do not normalize with antipsychotic med medication. Right? So there's um, the last part of my uh, talk, I'm going to speak about bioenergetic dysfunction hypothesis, and that has to do um, with um, mitochondria. So why mitochondria? Mitochondria generate 90% of cellular ATP in the world. So the synaptic transmission accounts for 40% of the ATP consumed, and the neural activity at higher frequencies, such as GABA in general, are more mit mitochondria dependent. So this is about ATP production. So ATP production is, who is really the, what, what, what is really important for synaptic transmission. So then, you know, my the possibility or my hypothesis is for real is that um, those abnormality in bioenergetic in the mitochondria may explain why there's imbalance in inhibition excitation in patient, and that explain abnormal functional connecti connectivity and abnormal treatment response. So. Um, so, how are we going to do that? And this is where it's an interest, interesting thing. We look at um, the mitochondria in the anterior cingulate. This is post-mortem studies uh, done by Rosie Bobert at UAB, showing that there's a decrease in mit mitochondria in neuron. It was not uh, the size of the mitochondria, it was the number significantly different. That got my attention. And I thought, you know, uh, and then I, I started to look a little bit around and realized there was a, already a, a lot of uh, information and studies that have been doing and look, looking at bioenergetic in schizophrenia. So there's um, 
an imaging technique is not, it's an MRS technique, it's a spectroscopy, but it is not a photon spectroscopy, it's a phosphorus. So this, with, with that technique, you can measure metabolite that has phosphorus, right? Like phosphocreatine, inorganic phosphorus, and ATP. So this is the spectra that you get uh, when you do um, phosphorus imaging. There's a twist because the phosphorus um, signal is very weak. So you, you need to use a, 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 a magnet that is very powerful. So for those studies, we use a seven Tesla magnet to be able to look at the signal. Um, there's another group in the United States at McLean that the Dos Angur uh, group has done this technique, have used that this technique, and they use that at, uh, for Tesla. And with, so with that, you measure static uh, measurement of those uh, neural metabolites, but there's also a technique called magnetization transfer that allows you to look at the, 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 re, the reaction rate of those uh, reactions. So let's speak about creatine kinase. You can see that it's the enzyme involved in the synthesis of ATP from uh, phosphocreatine and ADP. So this is uh, where we have the creatine kinase. And then the ATP is uh, really looking at the, uh, a, the, the creation of a, ADP from ATP, and it's at this level. So why is that important to measure those dynamic measures? So just imagine what with the static, you measure ATP. But with the dynamic now, you, you measure how much ATP is there that is produced per amount of time. So that's really, you know, get you to another level to understand what, what's happening. So we did a, a study, those were done, as I mentioned, at 70. The patient was, uh, first, they were medicated first episode patient. I have to say that first to, to, to use a 70 magnet, we have to drive two hours. So, um, you know, it's difficult to uh, drive with a patient who is acutely uh, psychotic. So you know, that's why we have to um, do, you know, involve medicated patient. And what you see here at the static measurement, there were no significant difference between the two, but there were significant difference in the reaction rate of the creatine kinase. As you can see, the red are patient, the blue are healthy control, and the same in the CK4. And this replicated the studies that had been done uh, by Dos Unger and Aklin, who has done studies uh, in chronic patients with schizophrenia in first episode, and found exactly the same abnormality, uh, um, a decrease in reaction rate of the of the um, of ATP. So then now, you know, the way I look at it is that, you know, we are trying to go upstream, right? So we have GABA abnormality, you know, so why, why are they abnormal? Why well, there's not enough uh, ATP production or it's abnormal, it's impaired, then it, it sounds logical to think that we may have some abnormality in, in, in those um, neuro, neurotransmitter. So I'm going to uh, just um, speak about some conclusion. Uh, when functional connectivity has really a potential as a, a biomarker of treatment response to antipsychotic medication, we, are, we have actually several groups in the United States who have put together a grant to uh, have a large number of patients and really see whether we can, this is a reliable measure to, um, to, to identify a treatment responder and non-responder. Quick. Um, longer GP is associated with uh, out of functional connectivity, good treatment response, and the relationship between GUP and treatment response in may, is mediated by the functional connectivity of the default network. So I thought you have enough to convince 
the clinician and the resident to really be mindful of those um, patients who have not been treated and, and, and try to start the treatment. So in first episode patient, hippocampal subfield volume continue to atrophy over a period of 16 weeks after initiation of treatment. And glutamate as measured with MRS does not appear to be implicated in this phenomenon. And in the first episode at baseline, GABA in the anterior cingulate cortex are reduced and there's no effect of treatment on GABA level. And finally, uh, proton spectroscopy, especially with magnetization transfer, is a promising technique to uncover alteration in bioenergetics. So all that is done with a, a group of hardworking people. Uh, so, for example, Nina Krojurjak that you see here has made immense, um, you know, it was of immense help for those studies. And then um, this is uh, Frederick Brown who came as a postdoc from France, Omar Maximo, Eric Nelson, those um, were in Malab, and then Jenner, Christine Edwards, and Will Armstrong. So I have to thank also uh, NIMH. Without the money, <laughs> I would not be able to, and I'm, to do those studies, and I'm really very grateful for that. So this is the end of my uh, talk, and we have enough time to uh, go on, on questions or comments. The cost of the energy goes how much of the you have, not necessarily the function of it there, correct? That's correct. So it's the kind of total amount in so, this volume. So this is a question about MRS that is pretty good for the um, hybrid thing is um, about measuring not the function, but how much glutamate is measured. Yeah. So it it has has a, I'm sorry? Sorry. Yeah. In, it has a mention, this is glutamate, you know, synaptic glutamate, glutamate in the neuron. So it's not very precise in terms of where the glutamate comes from. Also, in your treatment studies, how do you define, how do you measure, and how do you define treatment response? And then did you see any differences in this categories, types of symptoms that responded? Especially if they're really mediated by the EMF connectivity. So, very to this one. <laughs> yes. So, the question is about how we measure uh, treatment response. Um, well, we measure treatment response with, you know, the DTRS or the TANS. Mm -hmm. There's different criteria to, you know, um, and we've been looking at different criteria because we identified different, but we're still looking at that because it's an interesting uh, question. Um, you know, for example, if you if you guys on the 50% decrease in DTRS, you identify a certain number of patients. But if you use the NPS of the criteria, uh, which you for at the initial, you identify, you know, a different group, not usually different, but so you might have different, you know. Result by, based on your definition. I think that was really well explained um, in the American Journal. There was a neighbor has a had a study where she was making the difference between those uh, she response, remission versus response. And were there differences in the symptom clusters or symptoms that responded? Well, we we looked at positive symptoms, right? So we oh, only positive. Yes, because they are really. Of the end of work on those three symptoms. So that's why we. Um, the people online have asked if you would mind turning to the audio so they can hear you. Okay. Because which microphone goes to the. The one on the camera. Uh, so um, I'm not sure how I can see the chat. No, if uh, they only want you to stand here because then they can listen to you. Oh, absolutely. Okay. 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 So the last question had to do just 
uh, with the measurement of uh, treatment response based on scales, on positive symptoms, and the difference between remission versus um, improvement in uh, VPRS. Yeah. The hippocampal volume change that you showed over time with the patients showing smaller hippocampal volumes. Um, was there any specificity in those changes? So did you look at other brain regions as a comparison to see if it was more of a perhaps a universal phenomenon where everything's getting a little bit smaller or if there's some specificity? Well, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> is there heterogeneity within the patient group right. in terms of the trajectories? Actually, that's an excellent question because, you know, if it's a more global effect, that certainly would be... Uh, would that be asking different questions? Yeah, we have not looked at, you know, subtype. Um, you know, I'm very, as I mentioned, I'm very interested, you know, to learn how to do this uh, abnormal inversion of the hippocampism to see whether we could separate the group, you know, based on that, and then look at, you know, whether we have difference between those two groups. There's just some things at that end. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to slip in too. Um, you had seen no association between uh, glutamate um, levels not being increased with hippocampal volume, but I was wondering is there functionally less glutamate if there's decreased GAB? You mentioned it showed them on that balance GAB and glutamate. The glutamate levels were the same from the LP controls versus the first episode, but with the first episode, there's decreased. Uh, gap urgent tone. So, right. is there functionally still excess glutamate? Could that imbalance account for still account for the phone? I'm not sure. I really understand. So, there's a difference. In, in what is your question? Um, one of the hypotheses was that excess glutamate can account for the hippocampal volume loss. Right. Um, oh, I don't know what you said. So, yeah. Yes. So what you are really asking is that uh, what is the functional cons consequence of a decrease in GABA? Yeah, that's a very good question and certainly somewhat something that we, we will be looking into. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Opinion question for you. So, you know, Dr. Dr. Hyper sort of described your trajectory starting off in sort of these you know, biological psychiatry uh, meccas like like Maryland, and you've done all these studies. And you know, from from when you started off to where we are now, are you surprised? Did we hit the target that you would have expected that we would be at, or are you optimistic, pessimistic? What, the reason I ask the question is sort of the, the one of the most interesting things I think about psychiatry is the disconnect between how long things seem to be going when you when you meet a patient with psychosis versus just how small so many of the effect sizes we see in these studies are. What's what's your thought about kind of the future for this? Well, I'm an optimistic person in general, but I think you know. I think we have made progress. Uh, we have better technique. You know, I mean, even if MRI, you know, it's not that old. And if we can, you know, predict treatment response, that would be great. I think we started to make uh, progress in, you know, spectroscopy. I was speaking with Dr. Hackers this morning. My, you know, I've seen the difference between 3T and 7T in terms of spectroscopy. The, I think the results are more reliable with 70 and with large cohort, because as you mentioned, the effect size are small. You know, I remember when I started doing um, uh, spectroscopy, we had like 25 was a, you know, wow. <laughs> now if you have 25, you know, you, you will not see anything. Um, and there's, you know, we can tap, we try, try to understand other mechanisms. You know, we know that, you know, certainly dopamine is involved, but, you know, so can we, if we figure out maybe GABA, you know, 
you know, is GABA is decreased at the specific, you know, um, the target, therapeutic target that we can think about. The bad news is that, you know, those change in liver metabolite appears to be region specific. So if I see a decrease in GABA in the anterior cingulate, doesn't mean that it, it's, a, it's the same in other region. So how, how are we going to do localized treatment, right? That's going to be maybe also, um, you know, the, the challenge. So I think we are making progress. I think the fact that we also having more, you know, people doing, trying to enroll as big a group as possible, so multi center. The problem, of course, is, you know, we have to have the same instrument and they have to be calibered the same way. Uh, but that's, I mean, look at what happened with the genetic studies. We finally got some place where we got, you know, so many people, right? I think it's probably going to be the same for this. Yeah. Did I see the results, Frank, for the GABA where you showed the healthy controls getting lower over time to the point where they matched the patient group? Yeah. One month. There we go. Yeah. So, what do you think of that? Well, I I, I wish I would have um, the the Bogerson study. Um, Christine Bogerson at the University of Copenhagen. She has published and she she has an MRS. She has the identical uh, figure as this. Yeah. You know, uh, and. You know, the thing is that we are continuing. So this study is not done. Um, we have we are we are scanning up to week 32. So we're going to be able to see, you know, what's happening to those uh, measurements. But my in the past, you know, the measurement in healthy control were pretty stable. Um, so, but yeah, it. where you've looked at multiple baselines and I'm asking because I've done some MRS in the past where we've used multiple baselines and it can vary quite a bit even for the same person right. um, and I'm wondering about all the other things that happen when someone's sitting in the scanner so being anxious right. um, and maybe healthy controls you know being less anxious over time which right. might not happen but right. patient group just all these other factors that might contribute yeah, we have we have done that. You know, usually look at that. You know, uh, with the, you know this the coefficient of variation. You know, um, so we have done this for this. Um, yeah. One quick question: the data points here. You've got the sample size for. I'm assuming the patient group at the bottom there. Yes. The data is that. Um, Leaders only that you're showing there, or are the are you including the different sample sizes of each data point so that it could be the case that for like the healthy controls, they're just smaller sample sizes you go down. So oh yeah, yeah. This is there yeah. isn't really a change. Right. Yeah, subjects. that's a good point. This is just the patient. Yeah, this is not the healthy control. I have really to add that to, to that side. Yeah. And. I mean, we still we have analyzed those data um, during COVID, and we need we have more data that we have not analyzed. So hopefully, we'll have a greater uh, cohort in the future. There's a question there. I'm sorry. Can I go back to the slide? That's an algorithm, but with glutamate. With glutamate. Does it mean anything that the, the spread? Is already, but the first episode is required. This what you this uh, what do you mean the spread here? Yeah, so it's 
So it's less kind of mod. I mean, on average, it's sort of yeah. Right, but yeah. Does that mean it has been looked at actually? You know, and and so that you know, that's one of the finding in MRS is that consistent is that the spread is wider. Right. And you know, there may be heterogeneity here, right? So that's what we have to figure out also. If you have any idea, let me know. Oh. <laughs> All you brought this up, right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not dysfunctional in some way, but there's a big spread that disorganized period. I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think we have done enough for now, and you are uh, deserving of a nice lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think you appreciate all your questions. Sometimes the audience, you know, that doesn't ask any questions. Like, how must I be nebulous or something? We went on the tree, all three.